And welcome back again to the Law News Network. We're joined now by Troy Slayton, who is a criminal defense attorney out of California. Troy, good to see you again here on Law News. Thanks for having me back. Up next week, and it's the case of John Valerio. He's a defendant who's been sitting on death row there since a 1986 murder. And the circuit court has overturned the guilt phase of the conviction. So, you know, just to start out, let's go into the facts of this a little bit. We had a defendant convicted of stabbing a prostitute 45 times. The facts are pretty clear and the guilt phase of the trial, that stands. Let's talk a little bit about the procedure here because to understand where we are today, we've got to go back in time 31 years and we've got to talk about the procedure. So as we know, we've got the guilt phase of a trial uh, separate from the penalty phase in a death penalty case. And I thought, Troy, maybe you could start us off there. Sure, so um, in any, any criminal case, uh, jurors are not to contemplate punishment as it relates to whether or not somebody is guilty or not guilty. Normally, a judge imposes the sentence in a case. But when we're talking about a capital offense and there's the possibility of someone being either executed or being sentenced to life without possibility of parole, that goes to a jury. And, and in this case, that's what happened, and this man has been standing, sitting, standing on death row ever since. And whenever there's a uh, a case involving either life without possibility of parole or most certainly the death penalty, there are automatic appeals that go on and on and on. And this is another example of what happens after those appeals go on and on and on. You know, here we are 31 years after the crime. I think that it was an 86 crime, and if I have the records correct, I believe it was an 88 conviction. So here it is, 2017, and they don't have to retry him on the guilt phase because that phase stands. It's just the penalty phase. So from a procedural standpoint, how do we retry somebody on a penalty phase 31 years after the incident? Well, the penalty phase is a little mini trial. It's where the prosecutor puts on, tries to put on as much aggravating evidence as they can, and the defense puts on mitigating evidence. And what the Court of Appeals has said here is that there was procedural errors during that phase of the trial, uh, so much that we can't be confident in the, in the fairness of what happened and the the outcome can't stand. Sometimes uh, on appeal, uh, an appellate court will say, yes, there were some things that were done wrong, but it's what's called harmless error. And when it's harmless error, the result is not overturned. But that's not what we're seeing here. Yes, exactly. So let's talk about the facts, because some of the facts are going to presumably come into this guilt phase, because you can't find guilt unless the facts fit what would ultimately be a death penalty situation. So you've got this guy, uh, I think we have his picture, uh, his name is John Valerio, and he is uh, uh, was accused, was convicted in this case, 45 stab wounds on a prostitute's body. The body was found in the trunk of a car wrapped in bedding from his apartment. When police went and searched the apartment, it was uh, his bedroom was spattered with blood uh, her key, the prostitute's keys and address book were found in this defendant's jacket pocket, and his name was on a list of customers that she kept in her address book. It he, sounds like a mountain of evidence. Uh, that's what it would seem like. So it's not a surprise that this was a, a, a guilty verdict and a, a death penalty trial. Now, I don't know what exactly was occurring in the defense in the original case, because this goes all the way back to 1986. And even finding information about it quickly has been a little bit tough. The court docket, as you can imagine, from a 31-year incident goes on seemingly forever. But ultimately, the jury had to determine these issues. It had to determine whether the 1986 murder involved torture, depravity of mind, or mutilation. Well, the issue there was depravity of mind because the Supreme Court ruled later that depravity of mind was too vague for jurors to base a death penalty sentence upon. 
Interestingly enough, Nevada took 15 years to change its jury instructions after the Supreme Court said you can't use that language. I suppose there's a side conversation here as to why it took a state 15 years to snap into line with what the Supreme Court said. <laughs> yes, but that's, I mean, that's a whole nother discussion. Yes. Uh, attorneys and there are state commissions that fight about and argue about the jury instructions uh, ad infinitum. Uh, they, we, we are constantly uh, evolving. There's been a push in recent years for more plain language. Depravity of mind, I mean, that's not a, a word that most people use in their everyday lives. Uh, neither is... Um, guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. There, There's books written on what beyond a reasonable doubt to a, a moral certainty. And uh, it's not, these aren't terms that people are used to using. And therefore, it's the job of the jury instructions and the judge to break down these complex legal issues into words that everyday people that we ask to serve on our juries can understand and apply to the facts. Look, it took me forever just to understand guilt beyond a reasonable doubt myself, and that was yeah. even after I'd read about it. I don't know about you, but usually in law school, you have to read things five or six times, scratch your heads and, and say, what does that mean? And then finally a light bulb goes up and say, I finally get it after I've read 15 different examples of what either it is or it isn't. So some of these, these, um, these concepts, yeah, I mean, we can look and say, oh, yeah, well, that, that sounds like depravity of mind, but was it really? And uh, the, the definition comes after looking at, at previous decisions as to what it is and what it isn't. And then finally, as I said, the light bulb goes off and you say, now I understand it. It actually makes sense, but it takes a lot of studying. I, I'm assuming you had a, a similar circumstance. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's with so many uh, terms of art that are used in the law. And we can't expect jurors who are taking time out of their everyday lives from being uh, bus drivers and waitresses and business people and, and everything that they're all, all the, the things that people do that we pull them out of in order to serve on a jury and uh, apply what are complex legal issues that the lawyers have already been arguing about. Look, uh, we, we often say that the only person in the courtroom that is charged with knowing what the law is, is the defendant. Because we, us lawyers, we fight about this all the time. If the law was black and white, there'd be no need for lawyers. Exactly. Uh, you know, so, well, that, that's another side discussion as well. So one of the issues with this appeal, though, on the guilt phase is people say, okay, well, all right, so they threw it on the, out on the depravity of mind factor. But uh, if I'm reading the decision correctly, I think there was some dissent saying, well, torture and mutilation sound pretty clear cut here. I mean, torture more likely than not, 45 stab wounds, okay? Mutilation... I don't know many people that would look at these facts and say that that did not uh, occur here. Yeah, but that's not the purpose of an appellate court that is exercising independent review over a decision. They can't decide what they think the outcome should be and then do mental gymnastics or legal gymnastics to achieve that outcome that they want or even that they think is right. You know, as, uh, as an uh, appellate court judge, or a, a, even a state Supreme Court judge. Um, we heard this during the Neil Gorsuch confirmation hearings where he said, if you're, as an, an appellate court judge, if you are liking the outcome of every case that you decide, then you're not doing your job correctly. You have to, as a, a judge sitting in a court of appeal, when looking at a, a case from a lower court, You've got to apply the law the way that it is, even if it comes to an outcome that you think is wrong or unjust. Exactly. Uh, of course, then when you sit on the Supreme Court, it's a little bit of a different situation. Well, that's right. When you're on the Supreme Court, they're not final because they're right. They're right because they're final. Exactly. Uh, or, or at least we hope. So, you know, we've got that issue going on, too. Now, this this whole case took a, a convoluted appellate history as well. The uh, this Ninth Circuit originally on the three judge panel uh, found that this conviction was fine. 
but it's one of those rare cases where the defendant's attorneys petition for that en banc hearing. That's the term for every judge on the the, uh, circuit. the whole court. The whole court. Eleven judges heard it, and then that split was seven to four. It said he needs a new guilt phase trial. It's extremely rare for there to even be one of these so-called en banc hearings of the entire court. It is. That is rare. And the Ninth Circuit is sometimes uh, spoken about tongue in cheek among uh, us uh, legal nerds as the Ninth Circus. And that's because they are the most overturned of all the circuits as far as the Supreme Court cases that the Supreme Court actually hears from the Ninth Circuit. Um, the, the Ninth Circuit is one of the most liberal courts, and it doesn't surprise me that when we're talking about a case involving uh, death, involving a potential execution, that uh, the court would want to hear it uh, on banc. Exactly. You know, and some of the reason for that, I, I don't, I don't know if I, I can, uh, I can mostly agree that perhaps it's because it's, it's a circuit that sits in California. There's a more politically liberal mindset there, but some of it also is because California courts, especially federal courts, have to get into a lot of novel areas of law. I mean, California is a technology place. You know, the, uh, the courts in uh, perhaps Boston are not as frequently, at least, dealing with new software patents or right. things like that. The, the Ninth Circuit has to deal with a lot of really novel issues a lot of times. So, so some of, of that uh, creative tension, if, if you will, is just the result of that. As sure, there's a lot, of, yeah, a lot of technology cases come out of California, like Riley v. California, the mm -hmm. case that went up to the United States Supreme Court that held that uh, police can't look into somebody's uh, cell phone. Uh, without a warrant, that a cell phone is akin to your uh, your roll-up desk, and that the the cops, the government, can't look into it without a warrant. That it implicates the Fourth Amendment. That was a California recent California case. Well, you know, persons, paces, persons, papers, houses, and effects. Uh, mm -hmm. One would say a, a cell phone is a modern collection of papers, right. possibly or definitely an effect. So. Uh, you know, back to the Valero case, though, here, you know, th the facts are gruesome. Uh, it's a it's a gruesome description of a crime here. But it, it's just another case that points out the convoluted path that these death penalty cases can take uh, from a procedural standpoint. Let's talk about how you think this local trial is going to play out now, because now you've got either an attorney general's office or a, a local prosecutor's office that needs to retry the guilt phase of a trial that originally happened in 1988 that surrounds 1986 circumstances. So procedurally, how do we deal with a trial 31 years after the incident? You know, they, they often say that justice delayed is justice denied. Uh, there's a reason for that. As a prosecutor, you want the case to go on as quickly as possible. As a defense attorney, you want the exact opposite. We want to, as a defense attorney or as defense lawyers, age a case as much as possible because um, things happen. People die. Memories fade. Evidence gets lost. Um, a, a lot of things could happen. Other more, more important cases could come along. So when we're looking at having to um, uh, redo this phase of a trial 31 years later, this is going to be a monumentally difficult task for prosecutors. And it's something that defense attorneys uh, are going to enjoy. How could people, I can't, I can barely remember what I had for dinner last night, let alone what I was doing 31 years ago. Uh, yeah, and, and you forced me to stop and question what I had for dinner last night. So, <laughs> I, you know, uh, the, the train of thought derailed for a second there. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure witnesses who are available will be called back to the stand after all this time. The key being available. If they can't remember, they're going to have to have their memory refreshed from previous testimony. I'm guessing we're going to be getting a lot of readbacks from the record here. Yeah, we, we may, but then the defense will argue, are, are you just saying that because that's what you said all that time ago? Or did this really refresh your recollection? Do you, uh, witnesses are only supposed to testify to their independent recollection. Now you can be 
refreshed from anything. You could be refreshed from a cocktail napkin. You can be refreshed from a photo. You can be refreshed from anything. But the more and more that a witness is required to be refreshed before a jury, the more that it's going to look like they really just don't remember. And that's something that the defense is going to seize on, especially when we're talking about whether or not somebody should be executed. Exactly. I mean, is it possible that because of the length of time that's passed, it's less likely that the death penalty could be exacted here? Absolutely. I think that that's, that's a, a certainty that it's less likely uh, that the death penalty be imposed because people are just going to be worried. Uh, this is something that's been going on this long. Um, it, it, the jurors are going to have to be given some sort of explanation as to why they're, they're doing just this phase and this many years uh, later. Um, I'm sure that there's uh, publicity. There's going to be pretrial publicity, and they're not going to be able to find jurors that necessarily haven't heard about it, but the judge will be looking for jurors that can put aside any prejudices or discrimination that they may have uh, about the case. Do you think that it's more likely than not that the prosecution or perhaps even the judge and the defense are going to limit the descriptions of the length of time that has passed here? Is they it, might. Is it possible sure. that, that they might want to just tell the jury that you have to decide this very narrow issue? And they're going to limit references to the amount of time that's best to say, you know, there was a, a murder, perhaps even some time ago or something or or, you know, or are they just going to say these are the witnesses and these witnesses aren't available? I mean, is it possible that that could be the way that this goes? Those are well? those are all very good possibilities. Uh, obviously, the prosecutor is going to want to keep it very limited, and the defense is going to want to bring in all types of extraneous issues. Uh, the judge has to decide, uh, with regard to any piece of evidence, whether its probative value outweighs its prejudicial effect. And, and it's actually, it goes even further. The law says that um, if the, 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 if the, the probative value has to substantially outweigh the prejudicial effect of any piece of evidence that comes in. Yeah, and that could be an issue. It could just simply be that basic old threshold evidence presumption at play here. Now, let's talk about what's going to happen if witnesses are not available, because it's been a while since I've reviewed that prong of evidence law myself, because usually the witnesses that we see here on Law News are available. What right. happens if, if a witness can't be found from 31 years ago? What happens if a witness has died? How do they deal with that? Does that witness's testimony get read back into the record? Possibly. So the answer is possibly. Uh, this, this gets into an area of law called hearsay. Hearsay is an out-of-court statement uh, being offered for its truth. And when a, if, if they're going to read back uh, a statement, that is a statement that was made out of this court, out of this proceeding, and it's being offered by the, either the prosecutor or the defense for the truth of the matter asserted. Now, again, this is an area of law that books and treatises have been writ written about uh, the hearsay rule, and students spend uh, months in law school wrangling over hearsay and all the exceptions to hearsay. But a declarance, unavailability, the hearsay declarant, the person that said whatever it is that they're seeking to introduce, their unavailability is a potential uh, exception to the hearsay rule. And if they're dead, um, that certainly makes them unavailable. And then there are certain things that the court will look at to ensure the reliability of that testimony. And one of the main things is, was that person whose testimony is being read back, were they... Uh, were, were both sides given an opportunity to question them, and then the adversary, were they given an opportunity to cross-examine them? So if that witness was cross-examined by defense counsel back when the testimony was elicited, then it's more likely that it will be admissible.
Uh, you did a perfect job, Troy. I just, you know, people make fun of me because I have my evidence law book here that I, I keep handy. And uh, I'm not looking at anything. That's uh, I'm going off my, my own memory hey, there. Hey, you're in court way more than I am. I just <laughs> sit here and call the balls and strikes as they come across the screen. 804A4 on the federal rules. Now, granted, okay. this is a Nevada case, but many of the states have rules that, that mirror the federal rules exactly. 804A4, for those of you in the chat rooms that are always asking me how evidence wor works, uh, definition of an unavailable witness. That's uh, one of the subsets of the definition. It's a witness who is unable to be present or to testify at a hearing because of death. That's one of the, the uh, definitions of an unavailable witness. Clearly, if someone is dead, they aren't available to testimony. The exception to the hearsay rule that would normally keep out of court statements out is 804B1, former testimony is allowed. And you know, for those in the chat room who are always asking me about how evidence works, uh, you know, the book is long and the type is small and there are rules and then definitions and exceptions and exemptions and it, it takes a while to uh, get through the practice of of cutting through them. But Troy, you did a a job, a 4.0 on your law school evidence exam Thank you. in answering the question perfectly for our law news viewers. So um, I will have to send you your certificate for that. So oh, thank you. Uh, you can put it on the wall for your next appearance here on law news. So, um, you know, we've got this thing coming up. Um, I, I think that it's going to be interesting to watch because so much of it is going to be different procedurally from so many of the cases we usually cover. And a lot of it's just going to be uh, this topic we've been talking about, the length of time that's progressed between the original case and this case. I'm sure that there are all going to be new lawyers on it. Uh, you know, the chances of uh, the original defense team being still on it this many years uh, down the line would be slim to none. You know, probably different prosecutors involved with it. So uh, just a, a really interesting look. I, I think this will be interesting and educational to see exactly how these uh, minute evidence rules are going to play out in the courtroom. I I'm sure you'd agree. Yeah, absolutely. The I can almost assure you that the trial judge is is no longer on the bench. It's going to be new prosecutors. It's going to be new defense attorneys. Uh, I mean, this is 31 years of the. Uh, I'm not even sure if everybody is still practicing who was originally involved in the case. So procedurally, this is going to be new to all the legal participants that are involved in the case. Yeah, and, and I can't help but go back into some of the dissents in the original appellate case here. I'm circling back a little bit here, but, uh, you know, a lot of people are turning around slicing and dicing this language and saying, well, you know, if the standard was torture, mutilation, or depravity of mind, one of the dissents said, uh, and I'm quoting it here, any rational fact finder could find that stabbing the victim 45 times in clusters of eight on the head and neck and breasts and elsewhere was murder either with torture or serious physical abuse. So why are we fighting about whether or not this depravity of mind uh, would uh, be enough of an issue to overturn the penalty phase of this case? Because the appellate judge can't put himself in the place of the jurors. And so even though this appellate court judge looking at the cold hard transcripts and looking at all the evidence, uh, can come to that conclusion for himself. We can't. Um, we don't have professional jurors here. The the this appellate court judge, his job is to review for legal error, not putting himself in the place of the juror to say, well, if if this was a standard that the jurors could have found on as well. Now, part of me wonders if a. Um hyphenated verdict form would have solved this entire mess. What if the original verdict form had checks for jury decisions on all of those three elements? A check for torture, a check for depravity of mind, and a check for mutilation. If that was the original verdict form, would we be here? Well, I suppose if the, if the verdict form, if they were, if we either had that or there were several verdict forms that found on all of those elements, all of those three pathways to getting to uh, that that end, 
then uh, then yeah, we probably would not be here because there would be uh, something in the law we called arguing in the alternative, which is exactly what that appellate court judge is saying that, okay, even if it wasn't, um, didn't meet the definition of depravity of mind, we can find in the alternative that this definition was met pursuant to the, the verdict forms. But um, I don't think we have that here. So well, maybe, maybe this, is, this, is, this is why things always change. This is why laws change. This is why jury instructions change. And this is why even verdict forms change. Exactly. You know, this, this answers the question I've had many times again when I look at some of these verdict sheets. Is, why are there so many check boxes? Why don't they just make it one check box? Well, this answers the question. If the jury could have found each of those elements individually in the original verdict sheet, I'm assuming it's not set up that way because if it were, it would seem that we're, we wouldn't be here today. But I haven't uh, seen the verdict form myself, but I'm I'm assuming that as well. Yeah, and and it's so old that uh, I I don't have it. It's not in the electronic docket. I mean, I guess I could dig for it, but there are some things that not even I have time to dig up in the, in the cases that we're covering. And a 30, a 29 year old verdict sheet on a 31 year old crime is one of the things. Uh, that uh, I haven't been able to uh, to uh, just magically make float from Nevada to New York here. So, uh, you know, bottom line, uh, an interesting case that we're going to be covering soon. Um, you know, coming up here, I, I believe Monday they have off, but we should be live in this courtroom in Nevada on Tuesday. Again, the case for those of you following along is the John Valerio case out of Las Vegas, Nevada. He's a defendant who was convicted and then sentenced to death related to the 1986 trial, uh, or not to 1986 killing rather, of a prostitute who was stabbed 45 times. Troy Slayton out of California, criminal defense attorney. Always good to see you here on the Law News Network. I appreciate your- uh, Thank you so much for having into me. This, uh, this thing because it'll be interesting. Thanks for having me and I look forward to uh, continuing to discuss it with you. Okay, we'll see you next time, Troy.